I, you know, I had no idea what you guys had been talking about in class, except that there was this, it was called Morse theory, and uh, uh, a couple of suggestions were that I could talk about uh, various kind of aspects of singularity theory, because Morse functions are like a special restricted class of functions where you only allow certain kinds of critical points. So um, basically, this is something that annoyed me when I was a grad student. I just had no idea what it really meant, though I felt like I got it, but I didn't know what it meant. It's this thing, uh, this statement. Um, F, let's just say, um, let's just call it F. It's a function from X to Y, okay? But let's just say, for example, F can be C0 approximated. by a, for example, Morse function. Or another kind of typical thing you'll hear is it can, it can be approximated C0 close by a Morse function. Or another word is Morse functions are generic in C0 or within the class of continuous functions. And so just, <coughs> just uh, precisely what does that mean? So that's what what I talk about today. Um, so, uh, actually, Morse is kind of a distraction. This is going to be for any pair of manifolds, not just X and uh, R1. So, um, let uh, X and Y be smooth manifolds of dimension in and P, respectively. And uh, then for F and G in C infinity of X, Y, that means that all their partial derivatives, so, you know, X and Y are, are smooth manifolds, and so you've got these, an atlas of local coordinates on X and Y. And so locally, you can think of these as maps from Rn to Rp. And to say that it's in C infinity means that all of the partial derivatives, when you consider these maps as maps between the Euclidean spaces, all of the partial derivatives exist in, exist in the continuous. So, um, so uh, for f and g in, in this class of maps, there is an equivalence relation. which I'm going to write as total k, where total k at f is equivalent to g when all the partial derivatives up to order k agree. So this would be um, at a particular point, right? So in particular, f of x has to be equal to g of x. Right? That's the zero of partial derivatives. Um, so uh, the equivalence class of f, so the equivalence class <coughs> of f, is denoted uh, JKF at X. So this is the collection of functions that equal F at X and all the partial derivatives of the word K equal F at X. And um, so uh, this is also called the K-jet. The K-jet. So that x is a lowercase x. There's a bundle structure. So there exists a bundle structure. And the way that we're going to write it is a capital J, k, of 
x and y, and it maps to x cross y. Uh, whose fiber? over x and y is the, uh, the collection of k-jets uh, of functions. Um, maybe I should say maps, really. Maps f such that f of x equals one. So there, I mean, there's also a bundle structure going from here to x or from here to y, just projecting out x or y. <coughs> so locally in x and y, so locally, f is a p tuple of maps from R in to R, right? Uh, that's how you would construct a map from an N manifold to a P manifold. And, uh, and it would have to be sending zero to zero, right? You fix the origin because you've already chosen patch around x, right? You've chosen one such that the origin here corresponds to the origin over there, and you want all the functions to have the same value, right, as maps from x to y. So all those maps in the origin is zero. Uh, so each one has a degree k Taylor polynomial. Right? Each such f has a degree K Taylor polynomial. And here is the humongous disgusting formula. Fi, so each such Fi, right? So I goes from 1 to P. And each one can be written at least up to order K as uh, this disgusting thing. It's 1 less than or equal to alpha 1 plus alpha 2 all the way to n has to be less than or equal to k. So these are the orders of all the derivatives and the different variables for f. And uh, it, well, it's just a partial derivative. I mean, this is the uh, formula for a Taylor polynomial. Alpha 1 plus all the way to alpha n of fi. Uh, dx1 to the alpha 1 all the way through dxn to the alpha n at zero, right? And then you have this monomial, x1 to the alpha 1, all the way times xn to the alpha n. So this is, I never took this in calculus. I never learned about multivariable Taylor polynomials. But this is, uh, this is how they turn out. Right, this is a polynomial given Locally gives f i. So, so mm -hmm. in the case we learned about in calculus, we've got these factorials and the denominator. Is that oh, did I forget to? We don't do. Or? No, I, I forgot to write that down. <laughs> um, <coughs> maybe I should pull that thing over. Um, alpha one plus alpha n factorial. Thank you. So, you know, once you've specified such a p-tuple of polynomials, you've specified a k-jet, right? I mean, that's all the k-jet sees, is the partial derivatives up to order k. So, uh, what we see is, locally, well, the fiber consists of all such Taylor polynomials. Right? So, how do you parameterize the collection of these polynomials? Well, you just look at the coefficients, and so the question is, how many coefficients are there for such a polynomial? So, um, how many? Uh, 
how many coefficients? Uh, well, thank you, Wikipedia. <laughs> it's n plus one choose n minus one. Is it? Maybe that should be a k. Yeah, that's a k. All right, and I'll call that capital N. So what is this? This would be, I'm telling you that you have a bundle structure, but actually, since you can pick your coefficients, you're getting a homeomorphism. Well, I'm sort of defining a topology on the fiber, aren't I? By saying, parameterize the fiber as R capital N. And, uh, so, I'm sorry, when you say, how many coefficients? You're just saying like what's the way that like the number of how many have my partition k into like the sum? Yeah. I guess so. Yeah. Um, but that minus one comes from the fact that the constant term has to be zero. Right. Yeah. right. Um, and uh, sorry, one more question. Yeah. So this equivalence relation, you say all their partial derivatives up to the order k agree. That means that if you take the partial, you evaluate it at x and you check whether that number agrees. Yes. So the, that's this bundle structure is going to be a vector bundle, right? Just a of them. Right, so that was going to be now. I got one more thing to say, then I'll say the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is not really the dimension of the fiber, right? That's the dimension of each coordinate, like how many choices do you have in this coordinate? Well, how many coordinates are there? There's, there's P of them. Right, so actually, uh, so the fiber of pi k, I think I forgot to write that down, this is, this is called pi k, is homeomorphic to R p capital N, which is going to be very large, right? <laughs> Once you start. Anyway, <laughs> so the next part, I'm going to work on here on this, so the next part is uh, that pi k is not necessarily a vector bundle. Why is that? Uh, pi k is not a vector bundle uh, in general because. The, uh, this homeomorphism here, because the, how would you say it, the, uh, the way we've identified the fibers, the way we've defined the bundle, i.e. its transition functions, So I haven't really defined the transition functions, but I'm just trusting that you guys can see maybe where this is going <laughs> because I've given the fiber and then you have transition functions on X and on Y. I'd rather not slog through that, but the transition functions for this bundle uh, involve those of X and Y. That is, you know, this is locally uh, in a manifold, and those transition functions are not linear. They're just, well, it's a smooth manifold, and so they're smooth transition functions, not linear transition functions. But if x and y were Rn, then you do get a bundle structure, a vector bundle structure. Or even like PL or something? I suppose so. Well, what about at the uh, at the place at the corners. Yeah. Maybe you could say that maybe there's a type of generalization of vector bundles. What do you have? I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, this is opening a humongous can of worms. There's a, a humongous literature about jet spaces, these JKs, and uh, it just, it pays to just know what the word means. 
So, um, nevertheless, JK inherits a topology. Inherits, or maybe not nevertheless, maybe I should just say at least, <laughs> JK inherits a topology from X, Y, and R, P capital N. You, have, you know what open sets here are, and here, and here. Right, so you know, at least in principle, what open sets are. higher degree Taylor polynomial. Yeah, um, given by appending zeros. And then there's also a canonical projection in the other way. In some sense, what I'm saying is there's a bundle structure this uh, from here to here. Yeah. I guess the fibers would be kind of weird, but they'd be like Taylor polynomials that are truncated at the end and at the beginning. <laughs> So it respects pi k and pi k prime. Also, uh, so I should probably draw what I'm trying to say by respecting pi k and pi k prime. You've got pi k, you've got pi k prime, and then you've got x cross y. And this diagram commutes. That's not a very, it looks kind of fancy, but it just comes from adding zeros to two and one. Well, no, 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 no. It wouldn't be it by adding zeros, right? If you have a smooth function, you're not necessarily adding coefficients of degree, coefficients of zero, but right? you're adding further coefficients given by this formula. That would be the way that works. Wait, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry, you do not append zeros to the Taylor polynomial to go from here to here. You just go out further in the Taylor polynomial for a given function. Well, wouldn't those both project back from JK prime to the same one? I mean, we yes. just get a representative, right? Well, what I'm well, okay, so that it wouldn't be an embedding, right? Because if two functions are the same here, but they're different at higher order terms, they're going to project. They're going to embed to the same thing here. That wouldn't be an embedding. So. Yeah, but those would be the same thing in JK. Yeah, in those, JK they would be, but you're you pick it, a smooth function f. Then you well, take its k jet, and then if you wanted to see where it goes in here, you take its k prime. I think we were just thinking about taking a k jet rather than taking a smooth function. Yeah. yeah. Take a k jet. I guess so. There's like that's probably true, but you know, actually, I should just only look at where I'm looking. Let's <laughs> see. Yeah, you're probably right. Actually, I guess uh, you could. Yeah. I take it back. You do answer it. <laughs> All right. So should I say why you add zeros, just to be clear, <laughs> instead of adding further terms? You're starting here, so you don't know what those further terms are anyway. And so all you have to add are zeros to We kind of have a choice. I mean, maybe that's lots of different ways, but yeah, that's a there's any yeah. Right. Okay. Well um so there's a notion of J infinity. using the Taylor series for functions. 
instead of Taylor Paul Nobody. Okay. And uh, its topology. is exceedingly fine. It's generated by all of the open sets of uh, the finite jet spaces. Um, actually, it should be z greater than or equal to zero. Um, a smooth function, so, so this, here's another observation. A smooth function is interchangeable. Maybe it should, instead of a smooth function, I should just say f. We assume that it's like that. So f is um, interchangeable. section of J infinity of x, y maps to x cross y maps to x. So what would that mean? That is the Taylor's theorem. I suppose I suppose so, yeah. So it's like it's like the convergence data from Taylor's theorem. Yeah. So if I didn't specify an x, and I just said jk of f, then that's typically what people call the k-jet of f, and it's a section of jk. So the infinity jet of f is just f. So uh, a smooth function of the is a surjection. So there is a surjection. JK from C infinity of X Y to uh, JK of X Y given by uh, the taking the K jet of F without specifying X. So J lowercase JK of F is defined to be just what you would expect. So that would be like a, a section of this bundle that I'm talking about. And um, so these are also called um, are also called K germs. It's just another word people use. And so just a germ would be an infinity in jets at x. So, so finally we get uh, to the punchline. <laughs> so there's this thing called the Whitney CK topology on, well, you don't need C infinity to define it, right? We only need CK. So maybe I'll just say that CK x y. So these are the k times differential functions from x and y, from x to y, and it is generated by. Uh, well, I mean, you, like I said, this could be considered a bundle over x. Right? So it's generated by the preimages of open sets. Same for infinity. Right? 
And so to say that f is C0 approximated, to say f is C0 approximated by, for example, a Morse function, Anyone want to take a guess of what that might mean? Just given what we have, where I've been talking about topologies and what are the open sets and so forth. So just in, you know, if you think about sequences, you can, or if you think about like uh, every open set in the C0 topology containing F that contains a Morse function? Precisely means every open set in CK containing F. For the, the K is zero. This is like for a CK approximately. I'm sorry, I meant zero. I should say. Or maybe that should be K. Maybe I should I say this is a K, yeah, that'd be good. CK approximately. And CK <coughs> containing F contains a Morse function. So, I'm not sure. Y'all might try to think about this with me. I was thinking this morning, if you said, um, I don't know, let's make up a class of functions called P functions. Um, if you said that that every function is C infinity approximated by a P function. Does that mean every function is a P function? So like that is, mean is like a point can, is is the set containing this section. So this says that like so if you look at the set that just contains the section of some function. Is that right. set open? Is that C is the C infinity topology the discrete topology? Yeah, right. That's the question, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean it would be the discrete topology on the space of sections of that bundle. Right. Like open sets are sections, perhaps. I mean just think about like, okay, so if you picked a finite K, then we're saying uh, Every every function uh, is CK approximated, right? If we say it's C infinity approximated, so you can get as close as you want in every partial derivative. I wonder if that means that they're actually the same. Like if you go far enough out in the Taylor series, I guess maybe it doesn't put. Uh, constraints on earlier terms to say that later terms are also similar. I really don't know. Probably not. <laughs> anyway, um, that was what the statement means. Is what is the topology on this? That's all I got. So that's like half of the statement that most functions are generic, right? So you also want to say that they're open in that topology? So, uh, there is a surjection here where you take a smooth, all the smooth functions fill this space up. And we're saying we pick any, uh, we, pick, we pick any section of J infinity. We take a neighborhood of that section and there's going to be another section given by the Morse function in that neighborhood. So I guess it's like every open set contains a function. Yeah. Right, um, I mean like that would be the statement that like Morse functions are dense. Right. So I guess an open set in CK would be a union of pre-images of these open sets in America. Yeah, I, I'm just asking, yeah, I'm not asking 
like how do you see it? I guess just more general question. See if I understand the situation here. When we say generic, we mean in some sense like an open dense set. I think we mean that this is tr actually true for every F. Right? Yeah. I mean we haven't actually like. I mean this yeah, is just like I mean, I understand. the definition of what you mean to prove. Yeah. This completely. I think that this is enough it's that for genericity. I mean, generic means you've got some topology on a space of things, and if some you know condition is generic, that means um, maybe I'm thinking of stable, generic and stable, because there's some thing we care about with Morse functions mm -hmm. that you can. That I like to say they're C zero approximated by Morse functions, which just means you can nudge it. Uh, in this sort of garbled way, small amount, <laughs> and you get a Morse function. There's a small, a small perturbation. But what do we mean like, by small? Like, like, well, there's like a natural, there's sort of a natural way to perturb, like the kajax, and that's by like a vector oh, field. Functions. You were sort of like given by, like move each of the k partials, like linearly. I suppose so. If if you're talking about functions from R to R in to R, I mean we know what linear means there. Right. I'm saying like is there, like there's a way of saying like say you knew that this statement was true for some f, like every set containing f like actually contains an f. Well, this thing this bundle has uh, J infinity has. It's a smooth bundle, I never said that, but it is. Uh, so you can pick a connection on Jane Infinity, and then you can pick up also like a vertical distribution, and that would be how you might like, specify that perturbation. So really, we want K to be <coughs> zero if we're talking about more functions in particular, right? Because more functions put pretty strong restrictions on. I've only ever heard C0 approximated. And it might be that that's the best you can get, but it might also just be that if it has a bad singularity, then I mean, we all we only want more type singularities, right. which says what it says, and so it tells you what the higher order derivatives have to be. That, so you can ask for another function to be Morse, and yet match, say, the third derivative, or could you, up to the third derivative, like, if you have a... So, uh, like a high order critical point would mean that a lot of partial derivatives are vanishing up to a certain order. Uh, that would be a high order critical point. Uh, is, perhaps that's what you mean by that? Yeah, like let's say that the first derivative vanishes and the second derivative vanishes. Mm -hmm. That function is not Morse. Right, because you might say all the way <coughs> up to billionth derivative Because that's vanishes. a non-Morse. Right, but um, let's but, just say but zero is there. easy to perturb away from. Right. So I'm not, I don't think that having high order critical points is going to force you to make a large perturbation. Well, I, I think that I'm just saying, okay, say that there's a point where the first and second derivatives vanish. Okay. Um, that, that function is not therefore not Morse, right? Okay. And so any open set in C2 that contains that function, everything in that open set also has that property. That the first two derivatives vanish. Is that right? Uh, no, that would be the equivalence class of that function. That would be that particular uh, point. Okay. Oh, right. We just worry right. that those three would just be close to. Okay. Okay. I see. I see. So if you take x to be r and y to be r, mm -hmm. this is really the simplest case. It does this all sort of go back to? So I guess if someone had asked me yesterday, like, what is it? What is like being c k close mean? Like, I would have thought of that case with x being r and y being r, and basically said that you're sort of looking at the distance of, you know, what does it mean to be c0, for two function to be c0 close at x? Well, that means that their images are close. So I haven't said that 
I haven't I haven't explained what it means for two functions to be C0 close to each other. Right? I've only said a function can be approximated by uh, this class of functions in C0. There's a sequence of functions that approach F in C0. But I guess that's my question. So I guess Maybe, maybe the better way to ask it is like, yeah. but, it, but if if x's are and y's are, okay. right? Then if you look at the, if you look at c k r r, right? It seems like there's like a natural metric you could put on that. Yeah, it's just I, like I, the there distance. is one. I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm it's just like wrong. well, I think it's just like the norm of the distance of like the function value and then the first derivative and then the second derivative yeah. and yeah. all the rest of the k derivatives. Yeah. R capital N cross R cross yeah. R would be your right. total space. Right. So is that like, is that this? In that case when X is R and Y is R? Like is that the same? Is like, it like, like, like a Euclidean uh, norm, basically, that you're putting yeah, on right, each fiber. Right. Yeah, exactly. But you're um, including sort of like the distances between all the derivatives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that, that sounds to me like the natural metric to put when x and y are Euclidean. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah, maybe not. I think that uh, generally when you're dealing just with manifolds, you're going to use metrics on the manifolds um, to define the metric on JK. glanced over this really old um, book by Mumphries about this stuff and he does it in kind of the way you're talking about it. He does use a metric and he just does it in all in local chart, like in local coordinates. And, and it works out but it's really complicated. Yeah, so. yeah this is like the coordinate free version. Or some, somehow analogous to like defining like of or defining like curves as a equivalence class of vectors. Yeah, so how it has that feeling as opposed to like. If you look at Wikipedia, they use all the collection of curves through a point. Yeah. And you take derivatives of those right. and right. set them equal to each other to get total k. Okay. I guess I'm gonna go. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you.